Athletes in all kinds of sports have different faiths they hold in their hearts. We're used to seeing the sign of the cross on the field or a glimpse up to the heavens. That's got some players in a lot of trouble. But today on The Perspective, one of the people in sport who helps some of the players with their faith is the chaplain of the mighty Boston Bruins, Dave Ripper. He gets razzed by some of the guys about his last name, but his faith is rock solid. Today, with Mike Sherboneau and Julie Stoutland, faith in sport, and Pastor Mike with a word to encourage and inspire us all. Welcome to The Perspective today. I'm Mike Sherbin, and we're talking about the glory of sports and how we uh, idolize, you know, someone who gets the winning goal. I remember as a kid, I would rehearse in my mind in the outdoor rink. I was winding up behind the net. I was slipping through the defenseman, putting it in the top right corner. I was hearing the crowds cheer, but that ah, didn't really happen. What about you, Julie? Did you ever uh, play some hockey? <laughs> uh, no, no. But... Yeah, I didn't think so. What do you do? What do you do for sports? I am a fencer. I fence foil. That, that looks like a meat probe to me. Like, um, <laughs> is that like a sword, the Three no. Musketeers? Uh, well, it's not like the Three Musketeers. You don't but kill people sword. with that, do you? No, but in my mind, sometimes I think I get a little too excited. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so <laughs> once this virus is over, we're going to be in the studio and bring your game. I'm going to take you on. Absolutely. I got a hockey yeah. stick in one hand. You can use that thing. All right. Okay. You're on. You're on. You're on. <laughs> you know, there's something about the competitive, the uh, competitive nature in all of us, though, isn't there? As we oh, ponder the sporting thing, and yes. and yet I also believe that God has created us that way so that we can represent Him so well in all that we do to enjoy life to the fullest. And uh, while at the end of the day, Julie, I think the important thing is not to idolize sports, but to see that as a way to express ourselves. And it's one of the many things God's given us to enjoy, but it's uh, very competitive. We got a great guest on with us today to help us unpack these truths. We absolutely do. So stay with us. A conversation with the chaplain of the Boston Bruins, Dave Ripper. You are so much more than what you do, what you achieve, what you feel like. We want you to know there is so much more about you, and you are not defined by a goal, a win, or the position you hold. We want you to know you are more complex, more unique, and more significant than any gold, silver, or bronze. You, you are the total athlete. What is the total athlete? Faith, life, and sport. Welcome to the program today as we continue this whole journey of the church and the expressions of the church that how it has it in various communities in various ways. And I'm excited today that Dave Ripper is with me. He is the chaplain of the Boston Bruins and also the, uh, the pastor of Crossway Church that has three locations in the greater Boston area. Welcome, Dave, to the program. Thanks for being here. Hey, Mike, it's so good to be with you. Thanks for having me today. So like, uh, what's a guy who doesn't play hockey? How did you ever end up being chaplain to the Bruins? Okay, that should be my job. I'm the hockey player, so like, what <laughs> gives? <laughs> yeah, it's one of those really unpredictable callings that you sometimes get puts before you in life. And I got to know one of the Boston Bruins players, Adam McQuaid, who was coming to the church I was a part of, and he really started growing his faith pretty significantly. And then, uh, you know, we ended up starting a chapel program together with the Bruins and that's been going on here. This is season seven that we've been a part of it. So it's been amazing to see how God worked and uh, continues to. So what does that look like? Do you uh, have, like a church service with them once a week, or are you doing Bible studies with them? Unpack that. Yeah, it's far more of like a men's small group. Uh, typically off-site, we'll meet to talk about some of the key areas of life, really check in with how we're doing. Typically breakfast works best for an hour, hour and a half. And generally we try and do that every, every week to a couple of weeks. COVID certainly uh, throwing a wrench into some of those plans, but so we, we cover a lot of really important topics like our identity, who are we, and to help the guys understand that we are loved by God. We're not our performance. We're not what other people think of us. 
or who we're loved by and key themes like that and belonging, calling, uh, how do we find our security in Christ really are big themes that I think have resonated great with the guys. But I just love the solidarity and the mutual sharing. I think I just really try and facilitate opportunities for guys that talk about how they're really doing. And God seems to work the most through that vulnerable sharing and honesty uh, of the guys between each other. Well, you know, I was thinking how so often we look at Facebook and how many likes we have or how many people are looking at our profile. And, and for a hockey player, it's got to be very similar because, you know, you know, points for and against what they're, uh, how many goals they've got. It's so easy yeah. to compare. And understanding identity is, as you're saying, it's absolutely huge. So do you do a, a chapel with the whole team for those who want to come? Or is it just uh, off-site meetings with some of the players? Yeah, typically at the beginning of the year, we'll, we're able to make a bigger invitation to the whole team. And so, you know, hockey is not like that, as you know very well, not exactly the most Christian sport and not exactly the most welcoming of, uh, you know, the Christian influence, maybe like other sports like the NFL or, or things here in America. So I get a little bit of a window to kind of invite folks, but it's mainly something, for, a way for me to support the players and some of the staff more individually. And it's kind of an opt-in uh, sort of opportunity that they get to have. So to generally it's players inviting players to come. And uh, there's even now a conference that's being held in the summer for hockey players uh, professionally uh, present and past. And that's kind of like our almost big summer camp for uh, for <laughs> like we would have in youth group. And we see that the Lord work in some really powerful ways there amongst uh, different players. You know, I think of a whole bunch of stories. Uh, one time I was playing in a pickup league and uh, they knew I was the pastor. So they adjusted the schedule. They said, hey, you know, maybe if you get here for the game, do a short match, they told me, and get here <laughs> for the game and maybe you can bless the ice. I think, of, I think of another time, you know, I was speaking to the Toronto Blue Jays and they were playing uh, against the Minnesota Twins and uh, I was in a quandary. How do you pray? Who pray? Do you pray for which team to win? And yeah. I'm having a little bit of fun there because I know the Bruins are, what, fourth in the Atlantic Division right now. And uh, I'm sure you get some ribbing on that. Tell me about what it's like. What, what's some of the kibitzing the guys give you? Oh, boy. Uh... Yeah, you know, I think the guys definitely, they, uh, you know, I think they give me a good, good time with my last name, Ripper, is a pretty fun uh, <laughs> hockey last name. So <laughs> I, I do get ragged on a little bit there, but, you know, with some of the other challenges and questions, um, boy, I, I think, you know, I think a lot of the guys overall do look to me to kind of be like that that person in their life that they can ask questions to that they haven't been able to really get to wrestle with, with others. You might even be embarrassed too. So you know, I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one stuff with guys who I've done premarital counseling for uh, different players and their, their fiancés officiated one guy's wedding. Uh, so there's a lot offsite. That's, that's pretty that's neat. Really helpful. Yeah, yeah. So when you, when you talk about that, are there maybe one or two, maybe three guiding principles that you give to guys? I mean, after all, you're a preacher, so you got to have at least three points <laughs> um, but are there some guiding principles that you keep reinforcing in your conversations with these men? Absolutely. You know, I think, I think one of the key ones uh, for sure is about, you know, what we pay attention to shapes who we become. So as you kind of alluded to as well, it's easy to pay attention to our stat lines or what people are thinking of us or our ice time. And, and how do we really focus on, on God's love for us that we are loved by him. And as, and then we play from a place of being loved by him, not to perform, not to prove ourselves, not to earn our worth. And I think one of the principles then that the guys have almost maybe taught one another more that I maybe just facilitated a conversation to have is the idea that, that they really want to go out on the ice and play for an audience of one, not the crowd, you know, not the, the Boston fan base, which can love them or hate them at any given second. They're still pretty loyal, but uh, yeah. they'll give you their mind pretty honestly. But how do you really focus on playing for an audience of one, you know, within that? And we've talked a lot just even about some of those outside relationships that have been really important for them. So one of the funnier things that we talked about, I remember reading a book by Dan Allender, who shares how God is both loving and, and God, and, and how he's loving, he's both strong and tender. And so we started to talk about 
what does strength look like? But conversely, what does tenderness look like in our character and how we especially relate with our spouses or other loved ones? And the guys really did connect with that. And so we kind of go through that yearly. And it's funny to hear one of the guys tell another guy, and you're looking so tender here today. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you don't expect all hockey players to say. <laughs> coming from a guy whose last name is Ripper, I mean, that can only be a God thing as you <laughs> see that transformation Dave, I want to thank you for being with us today. Thanks for just jumping on and sharing some of those nuggets with us. I love the idea of playing for an audience of one. Thanks, Dave. That's great. Hey, thanks for having me, Mike. God bless. Thank you. We are all image bearers. We are loved and accepted by the Creator. We have a purpose, value, and a destiny. With that in mind, AIA wants to journey with you in faith, life, and sport. And this is why we exist, to help develop the total athlete, physically, mentally, spiritually. This is what we do every day. Welcome, Dave. So I want to get right into it. Tell us a good old hockey story, one of your most memorable times, experiences with the Bruins, or maybe some other team? Yeah, well, it's good to connect with you here, Julie. And boy, it's just been powerful to watch God's love and how love is all about self-sacrifice. And in a sport and in a world where you know, being number one is such an important thing, it was really fascinating to hear some of the guys just talk about what it would look like to be a, a follower of Christ and still to play hockey. And there was a very interesting moment where one of the defensemen spoke to another one of the players who were both kind of battling for the same spots at the same time. And, uh, one player, uh, Adam McQuaid, who's a Canadian, shared about how he was for this other player. As much as he wanted this spot, he believed the love of Christ would uh, really compel him to want to be for the other players and not just for himself. And that really just ministered to me, even as the guy who's supposed to be kind of ministering to the other players. And to see that type of humility, that type of other centeredness just moved me mightily and even made me think at the time when I was working for a pretty large church and a lot of us were all battling for kind of opportunities to get to preach. Would I really be for the other, uh, my other pastors and coworkers as much as Adam was for his uh, fellow teammates? And that convicted me a lot and just showed me God's love in a very unsuspecting place right there at the TD Garden after one of the Bruins practices. I think that's a wonderful example. You know, it's, we, we are competitive, but to, to, to show that, you know, the bigger picture, I think that's awesome that it, we, we, all, we all need to live up to that. And I know that it, it's not just sports where we need to live up to that as well. But uh, after spending uh, so much time with these pro hockey players, I want to ask you, what have you learned from them that is maybe helpful for young up and coming hockey players? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think character matters so much. You know, who you are is Ultimately, I think what God gets out of your life, and I've just seen some of these players get a re uh, kind of focus of their perspectives when maybe at different stretches of life, they were all for themselves. Everything was kind of about me. You know, ego could be a really big thing. And a lot of that just doesn't satisfy or deliver on what it promises. And so really cultivating character, being the right type of person on the ice, off the ice, to have that type of congruence that I'm not somebody, one person here and another person there. I'm really trying to be the same person, the, the same type of Christ-like person that God would call me to be. And that brings a ton of freedom. I think one other lesson to add to that, it was really fascinating hearing uh, different players talk about how you know, when they were younger, they would just think that if I could become, uh, say, a pro athlete and just maybe get to play one game on ice uh, at the big leagues, then I would be satisfied. Mm -hmm. But then they achieved that. And then they eventually felt emptier and thought, well, if I can just maybe get a full contract, then I'll finally be satisfied. And then they get that. And it still kind of leaves you wanting more. Or if I can just become an all-star or just you know, play a thousand games or hoist the Stanley Cup, then I'll be satisfied. But I remember one of our chapel uh, times Times where a veteran player was speaking to the younger players and kind of helped them say, achievements 
never deliver on all that they promise. So enjoy where you're at. Be fully present where you're at. Receive this season, this stretch, this part of your life. It's just a real gift from God and honor him with it. And that will make the biggest difference in life. And that will ultimately help you find the satisfaction you're looking for. That is so true. And I think we're all so guilty of it, no matter what stage of our lives. We always have to remind ourselves that. Otherwise, we get so caught up in the stuff that we want to look forward to and forget we have to live in the moment. Very good, good wisdom there. Um, Is there a thin line between success and failure? Like, how do you define winning and losing? I think you've pretty much done that, but is there anything else? Yeah, you know, I think it's so easy for us to evaluate our self-worth based on our performance or what other people think. And, and I think there's something that can transcend that. Uh, uh, Dallas Willard is a great writer and thinker, a hero of mine would say, you know, what God gets out of your life is the person that you become. So I think loving well, uh, doing your best, being faithful, I think, especially in these times that we're living in, yeah. faithfulness is just such an, a great goal and aspiration to be endeavoring to 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 be that type of faithful person and i believe when we live faithfully we live fully and that's what jesus has come to offer us that type of full life so being faithful i think helps us uh, to live fully and i think that's really what success is all about far more than how you know how we climb up the ranks or what our uh you know plus minuses on or off you know, on the ice, uh, yeah. who we become and being faithful to God is what success is all about. And at least in, in my perspective. No, I absolutely agree. I know that Mike has a couple of questions. So Mike, come on board. Hey Dave, just to uh, bring in a couple more thoughts about sporting. I know um, just recently the Bruins retired number 22, Willie O'Ree. What an incredible story. First uh, black man to play in the NHL. He yeah. overcome, overcame so many obstacles And as you're reflecting on that, how do you encourage the players to overcome the obstacles, whether they haven't won or their their numbers aren't as good as they'd like them to be? How do you speak Mm -hmm. life into them? Yeah, uh, his uh, player's example is just one of courage, uh, one of being willing to to kind of stand out, to stand alone. And I think especially for you know these Christian athletes in a you know kind of a non largely non Christian sport. Being willing to walk that narrow road, as Jesus described, is where we find life. And so encouraging uh, our players and others to make sure they don't just conform to the way the world's trying to trying to squeeze us into its own mold. But being who God has called us to be uniquely is a great way to, to live our lives. Wow. Well said, Dave. I uh, appreciate you being on the program again today. And we look forward to having you back in the future to talk about all things related to God and sports, and especially the fact that you are a follower of Jesus, his son. Man, I'm excited for you and uh, keep pressing on. In just a moment, I'm gonna be back to bring to you God's word for today. Through a rich history that spans more than 50 years and has reached over 60 countries, thousands of communities have been impacted through sport. Our passion for developing people through sport means that we have grown to include coaches, athletes, and communities from camps to college to pro and everything in between, from the playground to the podium. And we are with you every step of the way. So why do we do what we do? Because you are so much more. You know, as we've been processing what uh, Dave Ripper has been sharing with professional athletes, you and I are as important to God as a hockey player, a soccer star, you name it. And we need to realize that what is critical in our journey called life is what we believe. We've been talking about the essentials this week as we're unpacking the whole teaching on the church, what it's all about. What are the main teachings of the church? And one of the critical teachings is the Trinity, God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, all in one and yet have unique responsibilities. Yesterday, we talked about how God has chose us. The Father has planned our salvation. God is longing for you and I to be in relationship with Him. And He'll go to all lengths 
to draw us in if we hear his voice, if we want to respond to him. And I trust that you want to respond today. But the reality is this. For God to plan our salvation, it meant that Jesus, the second part of the Trinity, had to pay for our salvation. And we have a powerful scripture in the book of Ephesians today that I want to read to you. And it's in Ephesians chapter 1, and it's coming up on your screen. And we read this, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. When we read this statement, it is descriptive of what Jesus did so that you and I can have relationship with him. One of the errant teachings that are prominent today, but it's also cropped up under different headings throughout the centuries, is what we refer to now as progressive theology. Progressive theology is a really comforting teaching. It says that I'm starting here, and as long as I'm going in the right direction towards God, everything's going to be okay. As long as you're trying to get closer to God, you're okay. But what it infers is that I'm doing it in my strength. And ultimately, I don't need Jesus because if my intentions are good enough, even though we might say, yes, I believe in Jesus or I want to admit that he is maybe a great leader um, or a prophet, but ultimately, if I'm doing my own thing, then I really don't need him because I can get to God. So we start here and we're just moving in the right direction. Oh, they're such a nice, loving person. They're such a kind person and, and they believe in all sorts of things, but ultimately, do they realize that they need a savior? See, that's the difference. That's the difference with Christianity. Jesus made the audacious claim that he was the way, the truth, and the life. And the way to God is through Jesus giving his life on the cross to pay for that politically incorrect word that we don't like to use, sin. Yes, I'm a sinner. I can't say that you are, although the Bible says that, but I know that I am. Nobody had to convince me of that reality. And I come to this beautiful statement. It says that he redeemed me by his blood. We have the forgiveness of sins. We were slaves on the auction block. And when Jesus gave his life, he paid the full price. But it goes on and it says, in him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. The picture of Jesus' love for us today is described in the word that he lavished. Let me illustrate it this way. You know, I, I'm going to admit right off the bat that, that I'm a kid at heart and I love a peanut butter sandwich as much as any five-year-old. And I kind of prepared this before and I got a slice of bread and I put the butter on because I'm convinced you have to have butter before you put the peanut butter. Now, I have a brother who doesn't agree with me, but he's only living life half full. And you know, what happens is this, when we think about how Jesus lavished his love on us, well, sometimes I've had a peanut butter sandwich made by someone who wasn't my mother or by myself. And you know what? They put the peanut butter on and they just kind of spread it really thin. And, and, and I see that and I feel like I'm getting ripped off. You know what I want? I want it lavished on. And, and you know what? I like it thick and I like it there. And, and I prefer, although I like the crunchy, I prefer the smooth. But when I get lavish, that's what I'm thinking. That's what I'm looking at. And my goodness, it smells so good. And I know that if I eat it on TV, my, my mouth is going to stick together. But it's just so good, I want to enter into it. And that's the reality of it. You know, it's a simple illustration, but I want you to remember this, that Jesus has lavished his love on you, and you can't go outside of the realm of his grasp. There's nothing that you do that has not been too great that he can't forgive. He didn't just skimp on salvation. He has paid the full price for your salvation. And as we understand the teaching of the Trinity that God chose us, to be part of his family, let's remember that Jesus has paid the price for my sin and yours. And he's extending the welcome. He's extending the welcome today to come home, to come to him. Hi, I'm Dr. Grant Mullen, and welcome to today's Keys to Healing. 
Each time I'll answer a question and give you another key for your journey to healing physically, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally. When I became a physician, I started out as an anesthetist. Yes, I wanted to put people to sleep, but I worked in a small hospital, so we only did surgery in the mornings and in the afternoons I had to do general practice. As a GP, I was shocked and overwhelmed with the number of Christians coming to see me with emotional as well as physical problems. I knew lots about physical problems, but I didn't know anything about emotional ones. So God took me through a training program where he taught me the keys to healing physically, spiritually, and emotionally. In upcoming segments, I'll be sharing these keys with you so you can walk to freedom too. In Matthew 4 and 23, it says, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. Healing was an essential part of Jesus' ministry. And you know why it was so important? It was because healing miracles demonstrated to everyone how much God loved them and was personally interested in their suffering. Jesus came to show us that God is not far off or disinterested in our struggles. Matthew 14 and 14 says, When Jesus saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Jesus knows what it's like to be human and all the struggles we have. He never gets tired of hearing our requests, so you can be totally honest with him. So the first key in praying for your healing is to be aware how much God loves you and cares about whatever you care about. He's so close, the Holy Spirit actually lives in you. So when you pray, it's a local call and he loves to hear from you. Today, raise your level of faith and expectation and start praying for your healing. If you have questions you'd like me to answer, just go to drgrantmullen.com and use the Contact Us button to submit your question. And while you're there, have a look at our Free Your Mind program. It's an online video course that will walk you through personal healing mentally, spiritually, and emotionally. And I'll see you next time. You are so much more than what you do, what you achieve, what you feel like. We want you to know there is so much more about you, and you are not defined by a goal, a win, or the position you hold. We want you to know you are more complex, more unique, and more significant than any gold, silver, or bronze. You, you are the total athlete, what is the total athlete? Faith, life, and sport. Well, it's been a full show today. It's been awesome to have Dr. Grant Mullen, our doctor in the house, with his keys to healing, and we'll have him on again. And it was wonderful to have Dave Ripper from the Boston Bruins. And I have to say, Mike, your illustration with the peanut butter, uh, how we are not out of God's realm of forgiveness and that he lavishes his love on me. I love it. I will remember it. I know many others will remember it. Illustrations like that just really speak to us. God is amazing. I'm not a peanut butter fan, but chocolate, if you substitute with chocolate, <laughs> I'm with you. You know, Julie, the principle of the illustration is for us to realize that we can't outrun the grace of God. And he's extending his love to each of you today. Regardless of how much you might feel you're broken, God is the one who can mend a broken heart. <laughs>